thank you for joining us. We're here live from COP. The IFRS Foundation has just announced the launch of an International Sustainability Standards Board. And I'm delighted to be here today with the chair of the IFRS Foundation, Erki Likkonen, the co-chair of the Value Reporting Foundation, Richard Sexton, and Richard Sammons, the chair of the CDSB. All three organizations have played an incredibly important role in getting to this moment. So I'm gonna to come to you first, Erki, and I'll pass you the microphone. Tell us about how you got to this moment. First, I'm, I'm very happy with the result we have now been able to witness here today. But first, um, two years ago, we discussed and studied whether IFRS should play a role in sustainability. And our conclusion was that it must be demand driven. We are not fishing for new tasks. We ask people, stakeholders, first, is there a need for global sustainability standards? And second, should we play a role? The reply was overwhelming yes to the first one. We need global standards and still positive also for the second one. Then we started to move on, but we, we set up the criteria for successes, which were pretty, success, which were pretty high. We need global support from authorities, from markets. We need to have expertise. We need to have funding and so forth. We are now, now here and we are very happy, but parallel we have been able to conclude the consolidation, which makes this bigger success. When I said that one success factor was that we have expertise to go to sustainability, we didn't have it at home. So with the consolidation of the organizations, we get this expertise into the same family. That's why it's a very rare combination that we can do both issues at the same time. It's been it's been important day for us. I was very happy the spirit of cooperation we have had with the organizations because we have had the common purpose we have able to to go go in a very proper way there but of course hard work start hard work starts now thank you very much we're now going to cut to a video we've had the privilege of mike bloomberg in his role as chair of the tcfd which has also played a critical role in getting us all to this point and mike is going to speak to us about what it means from his perspective If you can't measure it, you can't manage it. That's something we say often at Bloomberg, and it's especially true for businesses and climate change. Sustainability reporting standards help companies track and manage how the climate crisis impacts their business, including the risks and opportunities they face. These standards also allow investors to reward the companies taking action to manage climate risk and avoid those that aren't. Today's announcement brings together a number of important organizations focused on this issue. It builds on work we've done through the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures and the Value Reporting Foundation to help businesses respond to climate risk. And it lays the groundwork for a single global organization to coordinate high-quality sustainability reporting standards. I want to thank the International Financial Reporting Standards Foundation the Value Reporting Foundation, the Climate Disclosure Standards Board, and the World Economic Forum for their great efforts. Together, we can make even more progress in the fight against climate change. So Richard, I want to come to you. Consolidation is not new for you. It was almost exactly a year ago that the IIRC in which you had played such an important role, and the SASB came together and became the Value Reporting Foundation, and now you're doing it again. Can you tell us why the IFRS Foundation was the right final destination for you? Thank you, and to do that, I'll give you a little bit of context, um, going back a little piece that brings you to why consolidation, why coming together. So if we go back probably I guess now 14, 15, maybe 16 years, we had some very forward thinking individuals, including His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, Michael Bloomberg and Sir Mervyn King, who separately but together were focusing on two aspects. One was how did you create a new reporting system, an integrated system, better fit for the 21st century, moving beyond finance into all aspects so that it would provide timely relevant information across many capitals. That was a terrific time, but what it did was spawn initiatives. 
Um, and that's what's led to the criticism, I believe, of alphabet soup as a euphemism for too many things going on and a lack of clarity. What became clear sitting in the IIRC was that somebody needed to make a move to begin to create that consolidation rather than sit with the IIRC, SASB, CDSB, TCFD, WEF, GR, and cetera, so the list goes on. Um, and we saw an opportunity to bring together the integrated thinking principles, integrated reporting as the overall frame with the sustainability accounting standards, industry focused, but very much market led to provide data points in the nature of reporting. Once that coming together occurred and the value reporting foundation was created, we recognized it was creating terrific momentum, not just for the VRF, but also I think across the market, many other factors yearning for momentum for faster movement. So this is, I believe, this coming together, this consolidation is very much a reaction to market demand, but it delivers some very, very important features for us. It delivers a legitimacy. You asked why the IFRS Foundation, because that has huge legitimacy around the world, an independent standard setter um, sponsored by the capital market regulators. So that's one thing. It creates greater simplicity because we are eliminating some of those initials, but we're also creating the new baseline, the new baseline around standards. And I think Rick's going to talk a little bit more about that. We are maintaining that momentum, um, the momentum that's so important in a highly demanding and fast moving world where issues like climate, but not restricted to climate, need to have better information to inform decision making, capital allocation, and hold people accountable. And then finally, the platform, the so-called building blocks or baseline platform, is a compelling way of providing something that can be global without dictating standardization to the globe. And that again is a wonderful feature that's come out of the conversation between the three organizations, but actually more than that. Uh, Mike referenced the World Economic Forum, critical to this discussion, as well as TCFD, which of course he's heavily involved in. So today, um, I think we have something that has the ability to deliver standards that can provide consistency, can provide timeliness, and can provide relevant information because we're bringing together groups that are experts in independent standing setting and experts in subject matter around climate, but around the ESG agenda more generally. And that's now the big challenge. How do we move in a consolidated uh, form under the ISSB, connected to the IASB, because that connection is so critical, fast forward to do climate, absolutely, wonderful prototype, let's get it to a standard, but then on to the other aspects of ESG and really satisfy market demand. And Richard, that's a great segue into a question that I wanted to ask you, Rick, which is the prototypes that have been referenced. One of the announcements today is that this is not just an announcement of consolidation. It's not just an announcement that shows leadership. It's an announcement of substance. There are two prototypes on the IFRS Foundation website right now. We encourage you to download them. And while you may not think that talking about prototype standards is the most exciting thing, this is actually really important. These are really representative of what consolidation really means. So I'm gonna ask you, Rick, just to explain a little bit about the history of these prototypes and why they matter. Thank you, Clara. And you yourself are an important part of the history of this, and I'll come to that. But first, uh, these two prototypes, there's one that is for the general requirements for disclosure of sustainability related financial information. And the other one is specific to climate, which of course is a major focus here at the COP uh, this week. And just a word or two uh, technically about the two of them, and then perhaps I'll speak a little bit about their, uh, their provenance, if you will. Uh, the first is the general one, while it may not get as much attention at a top line level as the climate prototype, it actually is potentially very far reaching. And that is that we know the ISSB is going to take some time uh, to, to first put out a climate uh, standard, but then to move beyond climate into other important domains of sustainability. And this general requirements prototype already provides a running start 
for everyone in the market to think about how best to prepare for that and, and how to link what they're already doing to an eventual process that results in uh, a, a standard, an ISSB uh, standard, insofar as it, it specifies uh, materiality. What will be some of the main ways one needs to bound their thinking about materiality? What, what matters for enterprise uh, uh, value? Secondly, uh, in alignment with the same materiality as the ISS, ASB uses, there is the adoption of the TCFDs four-part framework for the domains in which one needs to think about material considerations. That is to say, the firm's governance, its strategy, risk management, and finally, very importantly, metrics and targets, which of course is an enormous focus in the climate space in particular. These TCFD uh, frame, uh, elements or pillars, if you will, are an important part of the architecture by which a firm needs to think through uh, what is material and what tools are out there that even if the ISSB has not finalized its work on it, are moving in the same direction, are basically foundational to what will end up being that standard. And so there's no reason, in other words, for them to wait two, three, four years down the road for a finished product. This general requirements prototype already provides a conveyor belt, if you will, for, for everyone to have a running start uh, to move uh, in a fuller degree of sustainability disclosure. Lastly, uh, it lays out uh, some guidance about reporting channel. Now, this has been important uh, from, from our perspective in the Climate Disclosure Standard Board because we were conceived originally with a very explicit focus on reporting to investors in the mainstream report, whatever that might be in your jurisdiction. And the prototype is not doctrinaire. It, it does not specify which mainstream vehicle to report in, but it clearly indicates that this is about enterprise value creation, and therefore your primary audience is the providers of capital, and it is for you and, of course, the jurisdictional context in which you operate to determine what is the specific reporting channel uh, in this regard. Furthermore, and I consider this highly significant, there is guidance as well as to how some of the existing frameworks can be used interoperability and fit within you're reporting more generally on these wider subjects beyond climate. So I think basically it provides a bit of the, the foundation, if you will, for everyone in the market on the one hand and for the new board when it's configured to think about how, how to fill in beyond the specific thematic of climate. Now, maybe a word about the climate prototype, which of course is such an important focus here uh, this week. Here, uh, there is of course picking up the four pillars that I've mentioned previously about uh, the TCFD, um, but moreover, it provides a really quite specific uh, degree of information about many questions that, uh, that uh, CFOs and preparers, the chief accounting officers and firms will want answered. And so I think while this is not an official standard, it will be up to the new board to determine what goes out as an exposure draft uh, next year, it, it does, I think, already provide all stakeholders and market participants with a pretty clear idea of where this is likely to land and already begin uh, to move. Uh, so in these areas of governance, strategy, risk management, and metrics and targets, there's quite specific guidance in this prototype for how you translate the general ambition of properly reflecting uh, for, uh, climate related risks and opportunities in your financial reporting, but specifically uh, how to do it. So I, I do think, as you mentioned, that that this is not just an institutional or organizational uh, announcement today. It's actually a norm setting step forward for the entire international economic architecture, if I could put it that way. And um, I, I'm happy to talk about some of the provenance of this, but perhaps I don't want to go on too long with the segment. Perhaps we'll get to that in, the, in a second round. Absolutely. Can I just, just reinforce um, Rick's point about the importance of the general standard complementing the climate standard because it they're, they're the same framework but but there are many organizations who are very broadly focused around ESG already and, and want stability around how do we develop reporting and the general standard gives them that stability to go wider now knowing that as it moves into a formal standard it's signaling from the ISSB this is the form that you can expect work to that form and you should be able to adapt into future standards very well. That will allow, the, allow those who currently use SASB, who use 
uh, a whole host of different standards to, to work in a much more stable, clear environment today? Yes, I, I agree. I agree with with you here. I think the the big challenge for the ISP will then be when you go beyond climate. I agree. The result of a consultation was climate first, but not climate only. But there, of course, organization we are now will be but the same family has a lot of experience, and the cha challenge for IHSB will be the agenda consultation when they need to set up what order to go forward. But there, there, of course, it's important to have this presentation standard, which gives the framework and also the experience of what you have had. I'm sure we will learn a lot about it. But, but the first agenda consultation, what will be next items will be very exciting to see. And I'm sure the board will carefully prepare. What we have done now and the organization is to prepare the for the prototype. It's been very important not to not to that it will not take too long when we get the standard but of course the board standardization board will be independent that's in the character they will take decisions themselves respecting all the new processes but so far i think the framework architecture looks good thank you uh, keep the microphone could you explain to everyone in case they don't know the ifrs governance structure including how those board members will be selected Yes, we have three layers, three layers. Trustees are between, and trustees are the the institution which nominates the board members. It's also it's responsible uh, responsible for funding and responsible for for strategy. That's why in this exercise, trustees have such a role because we we took the issue of sustainability to the agenda. We are working now on nomination of the board members, and we must think about the funding. Board members, as far as their nomination is concerned, it's based on the quality. So I want to have best people, but of course it must be diversified, taking into account the, the challenges that we will have, and also geographically, uh, something which tells that we are a global organization. But but the work has started with the chair and vice chairs. Next we move on to the members of the board, and, and we have very good tradition on this uh, competence-based assessment which still tries to guarantee diverse, uh, diversity and a global presence. And today, Aki, in the press statement, it was announced that the new board would have a multi-location model. Could you just speak to that a little bit so that everyone understands? So, uh, just first to say that this consolidation gives some has some impact on this all, because we will be strong in San Franci Francisco and also in London. But at the same time, we need to we need to remember that when we want to be global, and sustainability is a very sensitive issue in many areas. We, you must be present, you must be engaged, you must consult with the people. So we have decided to have a presence in all major jurisdictions: EMEA, Europe, Middle East, Asia, Americas, and Asia Pacific. So far, we just had have discussed on those expressions of interest which were presented by the end of August, which was our deadline. And from that basis, Frankfurt will be the seat of the uh, of the board in Europe, so that the also the seat of the chair will be there. But equally important will be the the office in Montreal. The Americas, they have a great tradition also because Ayosko was there and it's it's a multicultural city. It's also a very uh, rich say, economic basis. There'll be one more, and that will be in Asia. But uh, but due to later arrivals of the expression of the interest, we will do this decision later this year, early next year. But obviously, China and, and uh, Japan are on the agenda. But then it will be done. And, and again, Clara, sorry to want to reinforce a point, but this multi-location model, not only for the board, but for market engagement for the development of the technical standards is absolutely critical. We're doing something historic here. We're actually starting global. Rather than starting local and trying to become global, we're actually starting global. That's incredibly exciting, but also very difficult if you're not represented in the main areas of the world to ensure their voice is sufficiently heard in that development. Can you talk a little bit about 
those other parts of the world which may have more private companies, for example, than public. What does this mean for private companies? Again, a, a really great question, and I'll, I'll give it a shot. I think Mark Carney covered that very well this morning, that we're not talking about creating an ISSB that is only, po only focused on large public companies. This organization, uh, under Erkey's leadership through the foundation, but with its independent board, will develop standards that are applicable to all who want to uh, report in a credible, trustworthy way on those subject areas. So it's very important that we don't draw a distinction between large and small, between public and private. It's increasingly important because if you look at business models around the world, they are changing. Um, we've all seen, um, some might say, a contraction in the capital markets because companies have sought private finance. We wouldn't want them ruled out of this, God forbid. We've heard a lot today already about the need to finance governmental projects. Again, why would they not need to be answerable and report across this suite of global standards? So we start from global. There will need to be interaction with other experts who are uh, Ipsas, as an example, who are more focused on public sector accounting. But the core needs to be consistent. Otherwise, it loses power. I, I just had to complete my, my presentation of the IFI structure. So we have a board and they really prepare and set the standards. But it's very important that they have a due process is how it's being done and we, we will we follow that carefully. And the question often is that when can the standard become mandatory? Of course, that's then up to jurisdictions to decide. So important is that the standard is accepted over the due processes and I hope in the area of climate, for instance, they will become mandatory. Then there's a possibility, a possibility also the proper assurance. But that's not in our hands. It belongs to jurisdictions. When I build upon the, uh, the private uh, market's point, you know, what we're really talking about here is, is corporate governance. And what in the 21st century is considered to be good corporate governance. And these, these norms that the board is going to create is a very important element of that. And uh, even if you're a privately held firm that doesn't have securities uh, publicly listed and overseen by your securities uh, authority, you uh, typically have uh, major institutional investors who have very important uh, uh, fiduciary responsibilities to a whole range uh, of beneficiaries, plan beneficiaries, who have an, ex an extraordinarily important interest in exactly the same level of high standard of corporate governance. So I would anticipate that this distinction between publicly listed and privately held firms, well, at, at a first pass might seem like it could be a bit of a challenge and a, and a limitation. I think as, uh, as these standards get taken up in the market, there'll be pressure from above political authorities and society and below, which is to say your investors uh, and your employees, I think is no less because the competition for talent is getting more and more intense. And as we know, younger younger people are much more focused on action and follow through than on on vague statements about these issues. So if you want to if you want to attract the best talent, if you want to keep uh, a loyal institutional investors who will stand behind your long term investment strategy as a privately held firm, I think you're going to need to take a very serious look at at, at uh, the same same standards of uh, reporting and information gathering as will be required by securities uh, authorities. And Rick, I want to come back to the conversation you started earlier about lineage, provenance. Um, tell us what brought us to this point in your mind, including the prototypes, but then also tell us, as you pass the baton here, what is it that you've learned from doing all of this work for a long time now at the leadership level that you want Erky to bear in mind, the trustees to bear in mind as you pass this forward? Well, that's a, a terrifically uh, incisive question that you're asking there. <laughs> Uh, have been at it for a while. Um, in a way, we've had three rounds. This, this is the third round, uh, as I look across it, of an attempt to get uh, organizational integration so that you have a scalable model uh, for creating the norm that you know, influences capital allocation across markets, across different uh, capital markets and jurisdictions and the like. The first um, was the CDSB's formation just about 15 years ago. 
which brought together then eight, now nine uh, institutions uh, who decided that uh, the questionnaires that they were issuing, the frameworks that they were creating were having an impact. They were, they were best practices, but because they, they were being applied by different pockets of the market, they didn't quite get that scale. And that the best hope for everyone in succeeding was to lock arms and come together behind uh, a common ask of firms. And at the time, there wasn't the interest on the part of the regulatory authorities or the international accounting authorities to do this. So there was a need for a bit of a workaround. And that's what CDSB was. It was, it was explicitly created in the image of the IASB, uh, even though it was business and environmental organizations sitting on the board. And we, you know, uh, we, we coaxed and cajoled uh, the best expertise we could find from the accounting firms. Each of the major accounting firms uh, uh, designated a partner and technical people uh, to work in the technical working group. And then we created a constellation of other technical experts from civil society, environmental uh, institutions, academia, and the like. And that motley crew, but actually quite a dream team of technical people from the public and private sectors really was the engine uh, in the absence of an official structure to create V1, if you will, for a climate and then later for environment. Um, the second was something that you were uh, involved in yourself, uh, um, uh, Clara, which was that a, a, a few core institutions, notably SASB and IRC, which Richard uh, represents uh, here today, uh, CDSB and CDP, which is the host of uh, CDSB, uh, and uh, NGRI in an early stage, uh, co-facilitated by your able self at the Impact Management Project, uh, our colleague Veronica Poole from Deloitte, and myself wearing my hat as a World Economic Forum person as well, managing director there. Um, we, uh, we had a very specific... Uh, discussion about how we could come together and uh, combine uh, technical forces and provide a vision that the market was asking for beyond the alphabet suit. And so in 2020, in the fall, we put out a vision of how the pieces fit together, how these different frameworks actually are quite complementary. Uh, and moreover, in December of uh, that year, uh, only a year ago, barely a year ago, put out a first version of a climate prototype, as you well know, a labor of love by, by various people. At that time, we didn't know whether there was going to be an IOSCO and IFRS appetite to take this up at an official, so to speak, level. Uh, but we put it out there um, and, uh, and, and turned that into a technical working, readiness working group, which involves the World Economic Forum, VRF, TCFD, CDSB, and IASB, uh, that, that, uh, that mixture of organizations. And they've been working very hard very cooperatively with you, led by you, uh, to prepare the prototypes that have been issued here uh, today. So if you will, th that's V3. The uh, group of five was V2, th what I alluded to earlier, and, and in a way CDSB was V1, of this cooperative effort to create synergy out of individual pieces in, in the market. And I think the culmination of that, why, that's why we're all so supportive of what you and your trustee colleagues have done here today is that you've seen that vision, you've taken it up, and I must say you've you've exceeded my expectations. Uh, you and your team, Lee White and company, you've, you've exceeded, uh, I think even say our expectations for how seriously, diligently, and indeed quickly yeah. you've uh, you've taken up that charge and, and put, uh, put meat on the bones, uh, so to speak. So, Erky, okay, I want to come to you. Of just, course. Sorry, just... just, just because I, I think the point that has been touched on there is important, and I'd like to add to it, actually. One, that this is an extraordinary achievement, uh, and thanks to the dedication of not so much folks like us who get to hold the mic, but the working parts behind our organisations, whether that's within the foundation, Lee White and his team, within CDSB, Rick's team, within the Value Reporting Foundation, um, uh, Janine and her team have, have just put in an extraordinary amount of work to get us to this position. And I didn't believe it would be done by COP. I, I just didn't believe it. Very, very skeptical. So I, I think you've absolutely over-delivered. The other point I wanted to add just into the conversation right now, though, is we need to be careful that we don't talk as if we're starting from nothing. And Erky was very careful on the stage this morning to reference building blocks and moving forward. Um, between CDSB 
um, VRF and its constituent elements, we already touch a lot of companies. There's a huge amount of support out there. Now, it absolutely needs to be brought into the um, public process under IF, the IFRS Foundation. But, but you know, we've got 75 trillion of assets that support the SASB, SASB standards. There are something like uh, more than 50% of the S&P 1000. There are two and a half thousand companies reporting under the integrated reporting framework. So there is a huge amount of interest to know that with, that's not all going to be thrown out. It's not all going to automatically move into the ISSB and this connection between the ISSB and the IASB, but it does provide that building block and therefore gives some stability, some confidence to those who already report, keep going, don't stop, bring others along with you and keep engaged in the development. Very, very important that we keep this market led. And and actually, Richard, to that point, it is a truly global set of stakeholders as well. And I think seeing the 36 finance ministers and central bank governors from across six continents write a statement of welcome this morning, combined with the global market participation, shows me why the multi-location model that you've chosen, Erki, is clearly the right one. So, so with that, I wanted to come to you at the end and ask you, what should the market expect in the inaugural year of the ISSB's work? First of all, we, we will continue to move fast. So we try to get nominations done. Of course, the best possible people to run the, the organization. We will settle down in, in uh, added to the places where we are now, to, to Frankfurt and, and Montreal and to Asia. And then, because we have the prototype, which we have so well prepared, and it's been joined the, uh, we have joined the work further with that, I would expect that we have good possibilities to uh, accept first standard, uh, first standards by the end of next year, perhaps third quarter, fourth quarter. That would be a very good start, because then the agenda consultation for the other issues, we have more time for that. So, but I would say, by the end of next year, first standards in the market, and that's remarkable, knowing the history of standardization, because urgency and 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 standardization don't go together. But of course, the TCFD has done a lot of basic work. We have worked a lot with the prototype, so we can take that into account. So next next year, we should have a product, and I hope because of the broad political need from below and from above, that will be also made mandatory sooner or later in many areas. And a consultation on the future agenda next year? Of course, no, let's see. I will, let, let, give them some time, but I would expect that they must do something, let's say, late this second half of the year. Thank you. So I encourage you all to go to the IFRS Foundation website. You'll find there three documents, actually. One is an overarching document. It gives you some context on what this technical readiness work has involved, which these organizations have obviously participated in along with the World Economic Forum and the TCFD. And then the other two documents are the prototypes that we've been discussing today. The Climate One has an extra supplement which takes you into those very specific technical protocols for the industry metrics as well. So we'll close the session there today. I wish you all the best of luck in this future endeavor. And I will close by saying, Erki, I was also told this couldn't be done, and we showed it can. So thank you. And thank you, everyone, for watching.